So let's talk about the outside of the building. Uh, actually, if, if I could, yeah. uh, one of the things is that you know, the story begins a long time ago. Uh, I actually first came on this project in 2012 uh, because we did a, a series of uh, public charrettes uh, with the city to actually site this building in this location. So we had a whole series of uh, public meetings, open houses, we did a whole bunch of uh, uh, public interaction and we showed the, uh, all the people who came three sites and uh, for a bunch of reasons, people thought this would be the best site in all of Greensboro to locate the, the, uh, well, close the performer to the park. center. Close to the park, close to the other cultural art uh, center areas. Uh, the park at that time was just an idea, but I think the, when, when the Tanger Center was located here, a lot of other people started saying, well, could we leverage that with public space improvements in the downtown district? So it, it was a sort of a great idea to twin both LeBauer Park, which was completed in 2016, uh, and then the Tanger Center coming you know, a few years after to create this new kind of um, anchor to the north end of downtown. So the sort of the master planning goes all the way back to 2012, but as a, a community sort of oriented process. So it was a collaboration with the community as you were doing this? The community, uh, the city, lots of different downtown stakeholders as well as interest groups, community arts groups throughout the city, they all wanted a place like this that they could perform in. There weren't any other auditoriums of this size and scale that community groups, uh, you know, uh, acts from doing pop music or the symphony could occupy on a, a real sort of a continuing basis. A lot of the other spaces in the city are either small, too small or too big. Uh, this was really a sweet spot for those types of entities that really wanted to do performing arts here in the city. It's just, it's, so there was a community need already established, mm -hmm. but this is going to be a showcase project for the Southeast too, isn't it? Actually, this is the largest Broadway house between New York and Atlanta. Uh, the, uh, for 3,000 seats, there are very few um, sort of purpose-built uh, 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 theaters of that size that can accommodate either touring Broadway shows, uh, pop music, rock music, uh, chamber music, uh, the symphony, all these types of things. Uh, there, there really isn't sort of that multi-purpose venue of this size between that area. So it's going to be one of the biggest uh, houses to open in, in recent memory. So great for the community. Yeah, absolutely. It, uh, Greensboro, what's great about Greensboro is that it has this all limestone, big, civic, robust uh, design buildings. So we wanted to carry that through, but in a more contemporary way. Uh, the city didn't want to have another red brick, white Tuscan column building. They wanted something that gestured to the future, something that represented Greensboro moving forward. So we tried to respond with a more contemporary view towards the building. But to achieve it, let's, let's talk about YKKAP. What, how are right. they involved? We have a, a, a very special uh, 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 curtain wall system um, uh, made by YKK. And it is a, a system that we wanted to make sure that it had kind of the presence that related to the limestone. That's why the dark bronze was uh, the color of choice. Um, and then the way the, the massing of the, the curtain wall was set up is that it's a two-story space on the ground level, but then we have a series of public rooms on the third floor. Uh, we collectively call them the pre-function suites. And we wanted to make sure that there was no uh, line, mullion line in the middle of the viewpoint. So we have a, you know, a good eight feet to the first mullion on the third floor. And we bring the curtain wall all the way up to the roof. So there's a lot of light that fills into that space up on the third floor. Um, and then as you go around, we have a, a, a canopy that is made by Dual Guard Industries. Uh, again, a, a translation of a southern porch. Uh, the idea that the, the entrance is really something that welcomes people that comes in. So the bronze columns, the translucent screen on the top is, is meant to really kind of say, this is the entrance, this is where people come in uh, to the center. We also have two side entrances, obviously because parking is, uh, people are coming, parking their car to a different, uh, to, to enter in different sides of the building. Um, and, and those entrances as well have a YKK uh, curtain wall 
um, and in a way provide kind of the direct entrance to the building. One of the things that was really important in terms of design, uh, as in any performer arts center, any performer arts center that we do, is that you want to actually structure a sense of anticipation when you get to the building. So the show actually starts when you drive and park your car in the garage. So at every moment from when you park your, garage, uh, park your car in the garage, to when you come onto the site, to when you enter into the lobby and get the experience of the lobby, all that is orchestrated to be of a whole. So we want to make sure that as any person comes in, that it's easy, it's, it's enjoyable. You're here for like a, a fun night. You want to make sure that parking is available. You want to make sure you can get your tickets. You want to make sure you can find your seat. Uh, everything that we've done was trying to ease that process into the building so you can experience the space. So uh, donor uh, was very generous, added some money to the project, and we were able to create a little courtyard with access into the, the, the lobby, um, and then a water feature installed here using uh, Mount Airy granite, uh, local granite, um, and then uh, it's, it's three fountains that uh, reference the donor's three daughters. So this is the, the grand public room, which was actually a, a result of a donation from uh, a donor named Elizabeth Phillips. And it will be uh, named Phillips Hall in her honor. And she was very adamant that she wanted a place where all of Greensboro could come in and be part of, uh, 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 partake in a public event. So this room is, is sizable. It's about 6,000 square feet. It has a 25 foot height to the ceiling. And the idea here is that uh, this is where the public comes in before they go to the show. But it could also be an event space for a wedding or a, a party or a lot of other types of uh, different events. It's really welcoming, already, again, following through with that experience into the space. Right, exactly. So the idea is here that when you come into the space, uh, when the space is completely finished, there will be bars, there will be uh, seating areas that people can relax before the show begins. Uh, we have a large donor wall that's gonna go along this side of the, underneath the balcony. Uh, basically where that line of uh, areas to show the almost a thousand people who have donated money uh, to make this project begin. And the idea is that it's a two-story space so people up on the second level can look down and see what's happening. Also the founder's room, which is that window up on the upper level, creates a great view looking down to the lobby as well. The box office is really straight through on that side towards the parking lot. Uh, the VIP parking lot that people who have paid some additional fee can get parking right in front of the front door. So this whole space is sort of the crossroads where everything comes together. Well, I like how the staircase also impacts the overall. Right, and actually that was a very controversial thing. The initial designs for the project had the staircase in the middle, and the elevators, for whatever reason, um, uh, early design, we had them separated on both sides. And it never made any sense because, you know, if you, one elevator comes and it's full and you see the other elevator come, you're not going to like say, stop, wait for the elevator, I'm going to run all the way across. So one of the things that we really did that really made this room is we put the elevators together and we created these two grand staircases on the other side uh, with glass, a porcelain tile finish. Uh, the glass and the railings are by Livers, uh, bronze. Uh, the uh, tile on the porcelain tile is by Dal Tile, but it all comes together in having this grand staircase on both sides for people going up to the grand tier of seating. And a lot of design decisions went into the restrooms themselves. Every performing arts center honestly has to be able to deal with the crush load of people using the restrooms during intermission because you only have a 15 minute window. Okay. And luckily, here at, at Greensboro, uh, we had the opportunity actually to go beyond what was code required in terms of the number of fixtures to add a series of additional fixtures, especially for the women's room. Can we look at it? Sure. <laughs> no one's in here. <laughs> so we call this, this is the runway. And with all due respect to uh, the women in the party here, it's uh, the idea is that people do line up. Uh, and wait here. 
Um, we have then the restroom here is actually almost uh, almost 50 fixtures uh, for this women's uh, room. We actually think this is the largest women's restroom in any performing arts center in the country, just in terms of the number of stalls. Uh, but the idea here is that the, the wait should not be long. We should move people through very quickly. Some of the things that are in the restroom that are actually kind of interesting is that we have these hammered sinks that were actually a donation from a local new North Carolina company. Uh, Clifford uh, uh, is the name of the company. And these are hand hammered uh, uh, sinks made out of copper. So these are all kind of hand finished uh, copper sinks that were installed here. Um, and then all the sinks, even in the back of house restrooms, have this, this special uh, type of finish. Um, and then we have these uh, phenolic um, uh, toilet partitions. They're actually made by a company called Tiny Hiders. Uh, and it's actually very interesting because the material is the same color all the way through. So if for every reason one of them gets, gets marked or scratched, uh, it's just buffed out and it's the same material all the way through. It's beautiful, huh? So we call this the gallery and there's one on, on the east side and this is the west one that overlooks Elm Street. And the idea here is that uh, it's really a decompression chamber coming from the Grand Lobby to the point where you enter the hall. Uh, we have to bring you down a hallway um, to prepare you for the experience as you go into the auditorium. The, it was very important for the, the community to be able to have a connection out to the streetscape. Uh, we are elevated slightly above Elm Street, but the idea is that there's a grand sort of uh, planting terrace here that will have lots of vines that will spill out and soften the edge of uh, how the building meets Elm Street. And you can see in uh, from the outside and see out. So the idea is that when intermission is happening, it's as lively uh, a scene here in this gallery for people driving by. And maybe they'll say, maybe I'll, I'll come to the Tanger Center for another show. They see the activity going on. Nice, enticing. Right, and then we also have a series of art pieces that are gonna go on these walls, uh, both this wall and also on the east side. So this whole zone here will have uh, large uh, artwork, uh, large format artwork that's gonna be visible from the outside looking in. So this is the green room. Uh, it's still being used as storage now, but the idea is that this is where all the artists will gather during the show and also the, all the back of house tech uh, uh, crew. And the back of house really doesn't have very many windows. This is the one place where we have added a window out to Elm Street for the crew, because uh, they spend a lot of time back of house. And the idea is that we want to make sure that they feel like they're they're part of the, the experience in the environment. What do the individual rooms look like? We'll, we can see one of the dressing rooms right here uh, next door, one of the okay. star dressing rooms. So this is one of the star dressing rooms. Uh, this is actually sized for a baby grand piano here in this corner, a uh, makeup table, and then they have a private restroom uh, just beyond there. And the idea here is that this is really, it's right next door to the green room and the entrance into the stage is right about 20 feet that way. So that uh, if the star uh, uh, wants to make a quick entrance on stage, they can run right to the onto stage uh, very quickly. And we have four of these dressing rooms for uh, the cast, um, in addition to a bunch of other dressing rooms for ensemble. Oh, good, good. So this is a sound and light lock, which is a separation from back of house to the stage, and then into the stage through this door. Talk to you. So this is one of the largest stages uh, for Broadway uh, constructed. We have an 80 foot wide presidium, arch, and then it's 90 feet to the grid iron up above. So the, the grid is pretty tight. Why is that? There, there are um, 80 line sets here that represent uh, battens that hold scenery and lights every six inches. So the grid iron up above allows the cables that run up the side of the building to come down to, to handle those battens every six inches. 
And the tightness of the, of the line sets is because you want to have as much flexibility for a Broadway show or any other event to light it or put as much scenery as they want. And therefore, that's why there's so many of them up there on the gridiron to allow all that to happen. It's a remarkably large space. It gets filled up. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, the, the idea here is that we're doing it for Broadway. So the, the stage picture out of the proscenium uh, works out to be viewed by the 3,000 people out on the hall. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that they're putting down the stage floor, which is a completely sound isolated system. You can see the sleepers on neoprene pads uh, further out there. Then there is this uh, built up plywood floor. And on top of that, there's a whole nother assembly of masonite, which is really the wearing layer. So the entire floor here of the stage is gonna be covered with the sound isolated uh, system. So I see Georgia Pacific, the platinum plywood. Is, is that a choice? Yes, it's, it's all part of the system. They, all the different components are, are selected in order to make sure that the sound transfer is at its minimum. So one of the things in a modern performing arts center is we still have to separate out the stage from the auditorium from, from fire. And back in the old days, you would have this giant asbestos curtain that had the word asbestos curtain <laughs> written on the front because people thought, wow, I feel safe. But nowadays, you see this giant structure just comes down like a guillotine. And right now, they're attaching a, a modern fire-resistant fabric that would prevent fire transmission from the stage or vice versa. So one of the key things about the hall is the, uh, the rake of the house. And it, it came about because one of the key donors has a very tall husband. And when we did some initial visits of other performing arts centers around the country, uh, she invited her husband and had him sit in the row in front of her so she could figure out what the proper height relationship from one row to another should be. And frankly, you know, the reason why this area here, the Grand Tier, is steeply raked was to ensure that everybody had a great view of the stage. Excellent. So in addition here on the Grand Tier and the orchestra and the balcony, there is not one seat in this house that has a, a bad view. I mean, every uh, seat in this house has a full view of the stage. Uh, and there's something called the Broadway Cone. So uh, Broadway shows are designed when they travel to have a series of sets and, and scenery that appeal to a certain number of people who sit in the audience. We've exceeded that. Everybody who's seated here in this area actually has an even better view of what will go on on stage, uh, just in terms of numbers of people. So it's, it's really designed from the experience of seeing a Broadway show outward. Now, the second piece of, of what makes this room special is that it is designed to be completely acoustically dead. The idea is that we have a series of sound walls that may look very smooth on both sides, but there are uh, a series of layers of, of sound isolation behind it, five layers of chipboard to deaden any vibration. Uh, the idea here is that when the sound uh, goes out, uh, it should just be completely absorbed by the walls. And why is that good? Because behind those walls, we actually have the largest installation of the Meyer Constellation sound system, which is an electroacoustic system that uses computers to process the noise in the room and then spits it out instantaneously uh, to make sure that it sounds right for the, the event. So uh, if the symphony is playing here, we can make the acoustic electronically sound like Carnegie Hall. If, if a, uh, a choral choir is singing here, we can make uh, the electroacoustic sound like Chartres Cathedral in France. Uh, the technology behind the walls, although you don't see it, is uh, top of the line, state of the art. Uh, it is the largest installation of the system in the country and everyone's really excited to see how that system can actually work in a multi-use hall such as this. The final uh, feature of this room is the lighting of it. Uh, the idea here is that we're trying to create a very intimate room and there are uh, strategies of lighting both the walls and the, the seating areas that are targeted to create an ambiance when people come into the room uh, so that they're prepared for the show. Up above, you'll see a series of 60 uh, glass fiber reinforced uh, plaster uh, ribs, we call them. 
and they are actually a countdown clock for when the show begins. The idea is that when the uh, people get seated and uh, there's a minute to go before the show, uh, these ribs will count down like a clock. Uh, there are 60 of them, and then we'll end up uh, extinguishing at the front of the room, and then the show will begin. And it's also a donor area as well. It's a sponsorship. Yes, a, a donor, uh, actually a, a really great uh, jewelry store here in the city of Greensboro. Uh, was really intrigued by the concept and donated uh, money to allow us to realize this. this so the ring, because they're a jewelry store. Yeah, nice. The ring of life, yes. Nice. So this is the founder's room? Yes, this is one of the venue spaces that the community wanted to make sure that there was a smaller space so people who had donated money to the project would have a place to you know, sort of expand their experience. Uh, they've given money to the project uh, to be able to provide, you know, uh, there's a separate restroom for them here, there would be a bar where they can get uh, uh, drinks during intermission. It's also a, a smaller room where they can have different events like uh, donor events uh, that don't take place in the Grand Hall or the auditorium. So it's supposed to be a very relaxing space. It has a view of LeBauer Park on that side, and then the lobby on this side overlooking that. Um, and then there's actually a connection to a terrace up on the upper level through a staircase that's in the back there. Um, but the idea is this is a place during intermission for donors to come, uh, founders, uh, people who are into the project at the very beginning. Uh, way back in 2010, 2012, they had the vision that this center would go ahead, and this is in a way a thank you for them to have their space here in the great idea in the center. The Greensboro area is known for philanthropic contributions. Yes, absolutely. This community is fantastic in the sense that the arts community, the community itself, uh, there are a lot of different people that really saw uh, the value of having a center like this very early on and wanted to contribute funds to make sure that it was realized. So one of the things that's important here in the center was that they wanted to have a series of pre-function spaces or other event spaces so they could have a full you know, slate of different events. So here on the third floor, which is above the grand public room, uh, we kind of recoup this space as a series of rooms where different events can happen. This room actually has uh, been sponsored by the Lee Wrangler uh, group or the Contour uh, uh, brands uh, right across the street. And then going forward, there's uh, a couple of the larger spaces. This space has been donated by the uh, Joseph S. Corey family, and it's the largest event space on this level. Uh, and the idea here is that it has, you know, the, they can have uh, public events, they can have corporate uh, events, uh, donor events. It's sort of a multifunction space. And then further on, on the west end, another suite donated by, the, uh, uh, by Brady Services, uh, who is also providing a lot of the me uh, mechanical systems in the building. Uh, they actually have a suite that they've sponsored on the far end uh, overlooking uh, the west. Very cool. Nice. What beautiful outdoor space this is. Yes, that's amazing because it was actually kind of a last minute addition to the project. This originally was just a roof area, uh, not really a terrace, but when we realized we, we were above the founder's room, which can be accessed through a stair uh, just down below, and the connection to the Lee Wrangler Lounge, it seemed ideal to have an outdoor space that could be accessed by both those spaces. Uh, a donor came, stepped up and provided some money uh, for the space to outfit it as a, a terrace. Uh, Joseph, Joseph M. Bryan Jr. Uh, is his name, and he got to name it, actually. And uh, he named it the Starlight Veranda. Oh, I love that name. Yeah, it's, I think the idea is that you can come out during intermission, you can see the, uh, what's going on at LeBauer Park, you can see what's going on in activity both in the lounge and the founders room, and then you can go see the stars on stage. Nice. So bringing the community and the stars together. Almost. Exactly. So a lot of collaboration went into this. It's not just what we've covered, there are a lot of other players. From the community to the design team to the construction team, it really was a collaborative effort from all different uh, shape, uh, all different places. And the, the number of design firms that contributed to this, they range from our firm in New York to a firm in Atlanta, uh, to a mechanical engineer in Nashville, 
Um, the construction team itself uh, is a local uh, Greensboro uh, firm that has done a fantastic job. And then even the performance specialties like the riggers and the audio uh, systems are also local Greensboro companies. So it's, it's really a great blend of, of state-of-the-art firms that know how to put together uh, performing arts centers as well as hometown, homegrown uh, firms that this is really you know, a, a, a sense of their community, a place where they all uh, have a sense of pride and, and really feel that this is uh, a civic place that will outlast them uh, to future generations. Oh. Many thanks to them and yeah. thank you for doing this. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming.